Hello and welcome once again to NCBI's Advocacy Talks live webinar session. This month we're talking accessibility, web accessibility, specifically the EU Accessibility Directive. And today we have two people from NCBI, two members of staff from NCBI, uh, talking about the, how the EU Web Accessibility Directive affects you, uh, how it is important to ensure that uh, uh, websites are accessible, uh, public web websites are accessible for you to use at your leisure and at, at your ease. Uh, today we have um, Karen O'Mahony, uh, NCBI's Chief Technology Officer, and June Tinsley, NCBI's Advocacy and Communications Head. So um, uh, please, please be advised that this is a live webinar, so we will be accepting questions. You can you can add your questions to the screen, and we will be um, posing those questions to our two speakers today, either during or at the end of the meeting. So please, everyone, enjoy the session. Over to you, Karen and June. Thanks very much. Um, as Liz says, I'm uh, June Tinsley, Head of Communications and Advocacy with NCBI. Um, and my job today really is to outline a little bit of, of what is the EU Web Accessibility Directive and why is it so important? And I suppose this ha has been um, a long time in the making, really, um, and Ireland is coming to the situation a, a little late in the game. Um, essentially, um, a mandate has come from the European Union to ensure that all public bodies have their websites and mobile platforms fully accessible to people with disabilities. Um, this directive was issued a few years ago and there was a um, kind of a phasing in period whereby all countries had to make sure it was translated into domestic law, um, which then put a duty and an obligation on the public bodies to comply with this. And in essence, in Ireland, we were late transposing that into Irish law. Um, and it means that the EU directive was supposed to be operational and fully, um, as I said, operational for, from September 2020. And we are now obviously in April 2021 and things are moving at kind of a snail's pace. Some aspects of the public bodies um, have made their websites and mobile platforms accessible, others are less so. So there's a huge piece of work on this in terms of making sure that public bodies are aware of these obligations and are fully briefed on what it actually means to make their website and mobile platforms accessible. Um, I'm sure that all of you can relate to the challenges that are faced by people who are blind or vision impaired in having a good website experience. Um, there, there are often challenges when uh, images aren't appropriately labelled or uh, files such as documents or uh, PDFs are, cannot be downloaded or um, features are not enabled to ensure that you can register or um, purchase a, an activity or order um, situations on, online. Uh, and I suppose the, the principle behind this directive is to remedy all these problems to make sure that everybody using this public body facility has access to the information and the services in just the same way as everybody else. So that's why the EU Web Accessibility Directive is so important. Um, and I suppose just for, for your information there, um, the National Disability Authority has a, a monitoring obligation um, within this. Basically their role is, as I said, to, to monitor how public bodies are um, adhering to the directive. Um, we had a chat with the staff in the National Disability Authority only recently to, to get a sense of what their um, work is in, in this area. And they're also trying to, to finalise how they're going to approach this. Um, they're obviously very keen to issue guidance and communications to the public bodies to make sure that they are aware of their obligations, but also in turn, they will be conducting kind of reviews and um, assessments of the websites so that they can then feed back to these public bodies and kind of say that how how fair, how well they are faring against this directive. So in a nutshell, I suppose that is the directive. NCBI are certainly very vocal on it at the minute because we really want to publicise the need for this compliance. 
um, and to up our game as a um, country in making sure that everybody does have access to public body websites and mobile platforms in, in as much the same way as everybody else. So to that end, NCBI are involved in a, in a number of initiatives. One is around conducting accessibility audits ourselves of different public bodies and private bodies as well, because in essence, we want to make sure that um, there is a, a everybody ups their game in this respect, um, be, it, be, be it a private company or a public body. Um, but as I said, the, the Web Accessibility Directive only relates to, to public bodies. Um, and I suppose I'll just hand over to, to Kyron now just a little bit to um, highlight the, the work that we are doing in that area of web accessibility um, audits that we want to do. And also to in, invite you guys to kind of share with us the experiences you've had with different public bodies and um, websites to see um, what your experience has been to date with those. But at the minute I'll, I'll pass over to Kyron. Hi, hi everybody, thanks June. Um, and and just thanks everyone for having me uh, today. Um, as June said, um, my name is Kyron Amahani, I'm the Chief Technology Officer with NCBI. Um, I think this this piece of legislation is is hugely powerful for for people with sight loss. Um, I think you know NCBI has been working very diligently, diligently excuse me, uh, behind the scenes to make sure that you know we can understand it and be. Uh, aligned with the advocacy team to make sure that we are, um, you know, letting everyone know the importance and the need for this legislation to be uh, adhered to. Um, it's it's quite a comprehensive piece. Just to give some background on on the actual WCGA um, uh, um, standards. So th there's a huge list of conformance standards that people need to address. Um, to make their websites and applications accessible. And we've reviewed them all, and we, as June mentioned, support some companies along the way around you know, making sure that their websites and applications are accessible. Um, a big one that we worked with before was the HSC COVID uh, Ireland Tracker app, which is the most popular app in, in Ireland. It's, it has about 1.3 uh, million users. So if you think from that, like it's kind of a recognized statistic that you know about 20% of of all of the population require some level of assistance from um, an accessibility standpoint or an inclusion standpoint. So if you look at the most you know, popular app that Ireland has ever released, you know, you're talking upwards of 300,000 people that would have been impacted if that app would not have been or was not accessible. So we worked with the HSC, we reviewed the app when it was still being built and made sure that it was accessible for people with sight loss and they've worked with us to make sure that the standards and guidelines set out under the WCAG standards are um, adhered to. Um, we've worked alongside other companies such as Bank of Ireland and Board Gosh and, and people like that to, you know, uh, to make sure that the, their apps and, and websites are, are accessible. And what we're finding most of the time is there's a great willingness from companies out there to, you know, embrace accessibility and embrace um, digital inclusion, but they don't always know how how to do that. And I think, you know, having the legislation in place is one thing to say you absolutely must make a website or app uh, accessible. Not a lot, a lot of companies always know how to do that. And NCBI has been working really hard to, you know, partner with, with organizations that are willing to, you know, put the effort in, which they're required to under law to make their apps and, and websites um, accessible. June, should I give somebody some insights into the, the actual uh, um, actual criteria for things being accessible would that be useful yeah definitely i think so just so people can kind of um get an understanding of the, the breadth of the audits that we are benchmarking and yeah. um, these websites against yeah so obviously our our priority by the nature of our organization is that we want to support people with sight loss and, and, and we do that and we really spend a lot of time working with organizations to teach them you know what it's like to to perceive a website if you're using a screen reader, if you're using magnification. But essentially, the, the legislation that was brought in is based around what's called the, the WCAG 2.1 standard of accessibility. Um, so this was this is a, the, the W3 organization, which is the worldwide essentially consortium for, for web standards. And this is a subsection that focuses specifically on uh, accessibility and digital accessibility for websites and applications. 
So there's about 60 checkpoints that you need to adhere to. So for example, um, they break them into four general areas. So is the website perceivable? Perceivable, excuse me. Is it operable? Is it understandable? And is it robust? So for, for someone with, with site loss, obviously you want to make sure if you're if they're a screen reader user, you know, to make sure that the heading structure is in place, that you can tab through it correctly, that all of those structures are in place that makes it um makes it uh, easy to use and I would put easy to use in inverted commas with, with, with a screen reader um, and the reason why I would say that is one of the things that we've worked on in addition to the standards is how can we actually make it easy to use alongside just make, meeting the standard uh, to work with uh, a screen reader and the NCY labs team have worked quite closely with uh, numerous companies to kind of explain to them what it's like to, to use a screen reader. And additionally, on top of that, so you know, certain requirements must must be adhered to on the perceivable side of things. So, uh, for people with low vision, it, the website must be able to be magnified up to two hundred percent without the loss of content, which is really important. Um, and I, I use, as someone with sight loss myself and low vision, I, I use that almost every single time I get to a get to a website. And and when it doesn't function or you lose content, content, it's extremely extremely frustrating. So we we tend to give advice on how. Uh, and how technically companies can um, fix that as well. So it is, it is a challenge that some that companies need to go through, but it, I don't think there's anything out there that's more worthwhile in terms of making an accessible uh, accessible website or an inclusive website. And the argument, as I said, that we make to to companies is that, you know, if particularly outside of the public sector, is that how would anyone exclude 20% of their audience? You know, uh, and for the most part, people are, are bought into that and there's a real willingness to to get their uh, websites updated. Um, is there any uh, any other areas June, you'd like me to touch on just before I, I, I can ha I'll happily talk on this for hours because I'm very passionate about the, the topic. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Thank and, and thank you for the passion. Um, I, I suppose I before we, we move on to the other topic, which is equally important in the area of technology, um, I, I would be again just extend an invitation to um, people to share with us what their experiences are mm -hmm. with navigating public body websites because it would be great to kind of um, have first-hand experiences of the challenges or or the joy um, that that you've experienced. And by public bodies, we mean things like um, the HSE, different government departments, um, different TDs, uh, websites. Um, publicjobs.ie, um, welfare.ie, all, all those kind of, as I said, predominantly government owned uh, departments or agencies. That's what we mean really by public bodies. I think it's important to point out as well is that if an organization has up to 50% funding by the state, they are covered under this legislation. So the likes of almost all charity websites out there, which I'm happy to say that NCBI is fully accessible. Um, is that they are obliged to make their websites uh, accessible. So, you know, um, the likes of schools and, and local, you know, the likes of GA sporting clubs, all of those are, you know, publicly funded websites. So if you're receiving public funding up to 50%, your website needs to be accessible under the current legislation. So, uh, and I think that's a that's a really important point because it it expands the amount of websites that, that are included and it is mandatory for them to have their uh, websites accessible. Um, tr true, and I suppose just the, to elaborate on that a little bit, it was and is, but it, the timeline for this was they were supposed to have all this in place by September 2020. Um, that timeline That's has obviously true. lapsed. So yeah. um, it's fair to say that th that breadth of websites have not been um, revised in line with this directive. And it behoves us and others to make sure that we keep continuously putting pressure on the public body websites to make sure that they are accessible. So if anybody does have any experiences themselves that they wish to share, please feel free to um, tell us over the, the um, questions and answers uh, tab or, or alternatively dro drop us an email um, at campaigns at ncbi.ie and we're more than happy to uh, link in with you on that. I suppose the, the other piece of information that we'd like to share with you today is, is another project that Kyron is leading out on um, and it too is hopefully going to be a, a game changer for many people who are blind and vision impaired. And it's the NCBI Smart Hub. Um, this is a, an initiative that we were uh, successful in receiving money from the Rethink Ireland to, con 
to create this um, smart hub. And uh, again, I'll pass over to Kyron because I'm not doing it justice on how fa fabulous this will be. Uh, thanks very much again, June. So um, if, if people could bear with me one second, I'm just going to share some some slides. So just one moment. So uh, I would just make a note, al although I'm, 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 I'm putting slides up on the screen, uh, nothing that's contained within these slides is, uh, I won't be calling out. So if, if there's people that, um, that have low vision or, or no vision on the line, and I, I'm sure there is, um, I will call out every slide. They're really just a reference point for me so I can um, form my thoughts a little bit better and I don't waffle for, for the next hour. So I'd like to give you an update on the NCBI Smart Hub. Uh, give you an idea of, of what this product is and what this new project is, excuse me, um, talk to you about where we came up with the idea, some kind of examples of, of how you would use the NCBI Smart Hub, um, talk about how we're, we're, we're governing this project, because obviously governance is very important from a charity perspective, uh, about the project timelines, how you get involved in this project, and it's really important that uh, for me that we have as much um, uh, involvement from people with sight loss as possible, how we're going to pay for this and then if there's any questions um, that you'd like to ask me through the, the chat function on, on Teams here. So first off, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I work, I manage the technology function within NCBI. Um, I've grown up myself with sight loss, I have about 20% vision, I suffer from congenital nystagmus, um, which is slightly deteriorating at, at, at the moment. Um, and I've always believed personally, and this is the mantra that I've brought into the team in NCBI, is that technology is the single greatest enabler for someone with sight loss. Um, and I, I believe that that honestly at my core and every every meeting I go to and, you know, every senior manager meeting, every board meeting in NCBI, I say this over and over again. So what do I mean by that? I mean, technology for me removes all the barriers to education employment and allows people with sight loss to fully engage with life and be independent. And uh, as I said, I fully believe that. And I, I don't think anyone that I've spoken to and friends and, and family who, would, would, who have sight loss as well, I don't think they disagree with that. Although feel free to, if, if, if you'd like, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Um, but this NCBI Smart Hub project is a new piece and it's moving into what I call innovation as enabler. And this is about NCBI building technology to enable people with sight loss to overcome barriers. And I, I think this is a really, really powerful um, concept. So my team came up with the idea of the NCBI Smart Hub. So what is the NCBI Smart Hub? The NCBI Smart Hub is building a smart application that will run on Amazon Alexa and Google Home to provide a single source of information resources and support for people with smart with, with sorry, people with sight loss. Um, and the whole idea of this came from smart devices like Amazon and Google, they're, they're, they're cheap as chips, you know, they're, they're 30 or 40 quid. Um, so they're affordable, they're accessible devices. They're screenless, they don't need a visual interface. You can control them with your voice. So out of the box, they've already checked a big accessibility standpoint, you know, and they're a huge enabler for people. So for a long time when I was growing up, I, I never listened to books, you know, um, I never read books, I should say, but now I listen to them using my, my Amazon Alexa at home. I use it every day and every morning when I come into the office here um, to read the news and keep up to date on news. And from what I've heard since I've joined in, in NCBI over 18 months ago, they're extremely popular within the sight loss community already. So this project is about building a smart home app that will run in both Amazon and Google that allow you to access information on site loss. And it'll be a single point of entry into NCBI services. So that's a very, very fancy way of saying, well, how about you ask Alexa to call NCBI? How about you ask Alexa to take part in an advocacy event like we're having now, you know? Um, how about you ask your, your Alexa to read you your Bookshare book? And I'm sure all of you are aware of Bookshare. It's an incredibly uh, powerful uh, uh, tool for people with sight loss to read books. All the knowledge hub on, and everything would all be available just through this one device that's affordable. Um, 
as I said, it will offer one to one support. So if you want technology support, you could say hey, Amazon, hey, Alexa. Um, I'm having a problem with a piece of technology called NCVI Labs and it will all happen through the device. Um, and then from, from our perspective, we'll be able to capture the information and log in on our CRM. So as you know, we use, we use a CRM so we can support people and that will continue to happen. So to give you some examples, <clears throat> I think it's best described um, through use cases and user stories as, the, uh, as they say. So you could say to Alexa, you know, tell me the symptoms of glaucoma or you know, call the NCBI helpline, play the latest NCBI podcast, all through your Amazon device, call NCBI's technology support live at line. And not to take any thunder from this event, but why why can't you listen to the NCBI live event, NCBI Labs live event? You could even do stuff like play, uh, make a donation to NCBI or play a bookshare title, read me the latest information on sight loss. Or you, for example, the Insight magazine that uh, June and her team send out would be read back to you via um, via Alexa or Google. And then something is basic to say, what services does NCBI offer to me? And all of this information would be available to you via your voice. So the project team, just to give you a sense, uh, I, I'm, I'm leading the project team. We have a project manager, two project managers working with us, Sean and, and Alan. I'm sure uh, most of you have probably sp spoken to Sean on the support line. And then Jean Kierner, one of the CRWs, is working with us as well to give us some real world feedback. Uh, we do have a governance structure in place um, for those of you that, that are interested in. So Chris and, and, and the other members of the executive are making sure that this is being built appropriately. And in terms of kickoff, so when do you think this will happen? Well, we've been working on this behind the scenes. We've been doing research and analysis on this since about November. We wanted to make sure that this was technically possible, which is, which is most important. Um, uh, and so that we can actually do it. We're going to need to um, find someone to help us build us build this like a development company. Um, so we're working on that process at the moment. The process is called a request for proposal. That's happening. It's just about to conclude. So we expect to start building this project. Development is starting this month and will run through till November 2021. Um, our full go live will be from July to November. And you're probably saying, well, what does go live July to November mean? So what we're going to do, we're so eager to get this, this, this new uh, project um, to use by, by service users and people with site loss, is that we're going to, as we build each function, we're going to release it to the public. So people can actually play with it and give us feedback and let us know, you know if it's right or wrong. Because what's most important to me is that we build the right product for service users and for people with site loss. So I really want those in the site loss community to get involved in this project and help us make this the best project that it could be. So uh, if you'd like to get involved in the NCBI Smart Hub project, I would really welcome it because um, we're doing this for service users. We're doing this for people with site loss. To get involved, all you need to do is email smarthub, S-M-A-R-T-H-U-B, at ncbi.ie. So that's S M A R T H U B at ncbi.ie. So smart hub at ncbi.ie. So what does it mean to get involved? You know, how much time and things would it would it need from you? Well, that's that's really up to you. Um, as I said, every two to three weeks we will we will release a new feature. And if you have time to use it, amazing. If you don't, that's totally fine. It's based on on what effort you want to put in. And if you find something that you really like, all we ask is that you send us an email and say, you know, hey, Smart Hub team, this is this is a really good feature. Here's how I use it. Or if it's something that you think is is not appropriate and you know it won't work for us, just pop us an email. We'll do lots of team meetings similar to this during the course of the project, where we'll ask people that uh, are, are involved in the project to come on and, and give us direct feedback. But again, it's not an obligation. It's if you want to take part, please do, please do. Uh, if you want to just take part and say this is not for you, that's also totally fine. Um, and I think it's kind of important as well for us to to point out how we're actually paying for this. And I think June mentioned it earlier is that uh, building any piece of software like this is really, really expensive. And we were very lucky to be awarded a grant to do this from Innovation Ireland or Rethink Ireland. They have given us uh, 200,000 euro to, to build this project. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you everybody for, for taking the time to listen to, listen to me today. I hope it uh, hasn't um, taken too much of your time 
And if you have any questions or answers, please do uh, ask them on the, the chat um, feature on Microsoft Teams. Or if you'd like to um, uh, contact me directly, I'm sure June can, or if you want to reach out to the advocacy team directly, they can contact them, them and I'm happy to answer any questions people might have on, on the topic. Uh, hi, Karen, it's Liz here. Yes, we do have some questions for you. Um, Brilliant. The first one with regard to the Smart Hub and a couple of questions we'll go back to on the Web Accessibility Directive. On the Smart Hub, someone has asked, what about Apple devices? That's a that's a really, really interesting question. Um, so we looked at, um, I don't know if you, if you remember at the start, I was saying we spent some time doing some uh, research and analysis around, you know, is this technically possible? So unfortunately on the Apple HomePod, that actually hasn't been officially released in Ireland yet. So we weren't actually able to in, include it in 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 our first uh, launch. I, I'd love to bring Apple online because I'm, I'm a, an Apple user myself, probably use a bit too many Apple devices if I'm truly honest. Um, but we would hope to do, once the Apple HomePod is released in Ireland, we'd hope to build something similar on that as well. Great, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, a couple of questions, keep them coming, keep those questions coming, folks. Um, a couple of questions on the, where the EU Accessibility Directive. Um, from Red King, are the accessibility badges useful anymore to say that a website is actually accessible, to say that they have done the work and have achieved a level of accessibility? Mm. Oh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And I think, you know, one of the things that the legislation states is that companies now must, rather than um, put a badge on it, they must put an accessibility statement. So the accessibility statement must state what level of conformance you reach in accessibility. So for example, there's there's three levels of conformance. There's A, double A and triple A. And the legislation states that you must reach a, a, a level of double A. So in your accessibility statement, you must say, here's how we, we um, here's the approaches we take to accessibility. Uh, here's the level of conformance that we've reached and you know, um, here's our, our 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 commitment, I should say, to to accessibility. So, wh while the badges are are, there's no harm in having them. Um, it's actually the accessibility statement that would be the requirement uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, thanks, Karen. Just one more yeah. on that. Um, cool. Anonymous, uh, hello. The good thing about web accessibility is that HTML is more or less accessible by default. So the only thing the companies are missing in this regard more often than usual is accessibility modifications rather than total inaccessibility. Many websites I noticed haven't implemented the ARIA correctly in their navigation section. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree with that more. I think as you know, the complexity of, of HTML in, increases and in HTML5, you know, incorporating times things like video and and developers getting more and more specialist in different areas of, of web development. I mean, I've worked in websites before that use um, the React standard as opposed to pure HTML, and it can be, it gets more and more complicated uh, as they build. If someone asked me recently, what's the most accessible website? And you're right, it's probably just a pure HTML website with you know, a, a white background with black text that says this is a website. And as they build them and they get more and more complex and people want to add videos and they want to add, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of pages, you know, with, with features um, that, that, that become more and more complex, the accessibility becomes that bit more challenging. Um, and I think what's great about this, this legislation, I don't know if everyone has, everyone has actually, I don't know if anyone's actually said what's great about legislation before in a sentence, but what, what I think is great about this is it, it, it makes the standards that they need to achieve much better. And you know the structure of websites are so important for screen reading, both the the menu structure and the the page structure. And I think if people follow the basic prim principles like that that person has pointed out, you know they will be accessible out of the box. But I think what happens is they focus too much on the the feature set of their website. You know, making it look cool as opposed to being accessible would be my view. Um, so I, hope, I I think that's a that's a really good ob observation there. And uh, Karen, it's Liz here again, Liz Jeffrey, Advocacy Officer. I have a I have a question myself, actually. So, um, 
if a person actually comes across a website outside of your 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 um, survey or any surveys you're doing, mm -hmm. what do they do? Where do they, from an advocacy perspective, where's the what's the best way to address that issue if they continue to come across either government or private enterprise websites that are inaccessible? I, I think well, there's 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 a few ways I I would approach it. Um, so if if it's a private website and they're not covered under the legislation, a lot of private websites tend to have an accessibility statement, and they would I would contract I would approach the contact in that one. I would additionally say it's worth reaching out to either my team or or or, or the advocacy team just to let them know that a certain website is inaccessible. But um, you know if it's a public body and they don't have any of that, all of this um, legislation is monitored. Uh, by, as June mentioned earlier, by the National Disability Authority, the NDA. So it's it's their role to to police this, so to speak. Um, it's not their it's not their role to enforce it. Um, that's the job of of the actual law, but it's their role to monitor it. So if if there is a public website that you feel is completely inaccessible, I, I would let us know because it's always good for us to hear that feedback directly from from service users to the advocacy team. But I would let the National Disability Authority know as well because that that's their role and they're they're listed in the actual legislation to say they are the monitors of um, of the of, of websites that are inaccessible. That's great. Thanks for that that advice, Karen. There's just one more has come in. Um, uh, in my experience, particularly in word in the WordPress WordPress navigation section, is particularly an issue. Most of the sites have landmarks implemented correctly, but they don't have proper keyboard navigation implementation. Yeah, um, and I think that's a that's a real um, that's a real limitation of WordPress, um, and it's really unfortunate that they reckon WordPress is is used by sixty percent of websites in the world. Um, when we actually built the, the new NCBI.ie website, we we chose to word, use WordPress because it was affordable, but um, Sean, a member of my team, spent an, a lot of time working with the team um, to make sure that our navigation worked very well with um, screen readers like JAWS and, and NVDA. I think the, you know, on that one, it's it's really, it is a WordPress WordPress issue, and I wouldn't dismiss it at all. But um, it's something that I think we, we we should look to reach out to WordPress and say, you know, this is a problem. So if you think if we could get them to fix their their navigation plugins uh, on on WordPress, it improves sixty percent of the websites in the world, which is a huge uplift for for people with sight loss. Um, I, I don't. I'm not saying that we we could, we could actually do that, but I think it's 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 a it's a valid mm -hmm. point. You know, it's a difficult thing to do. And I think what was interesting through the build of of um of the ncbi.ie we actually found bugs in some of the screen reader software as well you know that, that, that didn't work correctly with the with jaws um whereas nvda worked worked fine so um i appreciate that the, the frustration with, with navigation not working well it's it's one of those things that it is technically challenging to fix but it should be fixed i 100 percent agree it should be fixed great and um, there's another one coming in as well just to say yeah, personally I think it's important for people to know how to report bugs to developers because ultimately people don't don't do it and therefore they can't fix them because they don't know about them in the first place. Yeah, I, I you know, I think that's it. I 100% agree with that. And I've, um, if I can give you an example, before I joined NCBI, I worked in a, a company that all we did all day long is build websites and, and mobile applications. and most engineers and most most developers will happily fix these types of bugs if they know about them but they they really don't you know they're so much under pressure to meet a deadline or, or do things like that so if they're not aware of an accessibility bug they, they won't find it because you know only someone that needs that feature will probably will find it a lot quicker so if there is a contact us on, on websites or apps that you can reach out to um uh, you know, people will listen. I, I, actually, an interesting story one time is, I remember, I don't know if a lot of you use the, the journal.ie mobile application. And um, when that was first launched a long time ago, I actually emailed them and said, you need to have the ability to increase the font size of, um, of, 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 of the text because, you know, you know, people who are visually impaired can't read it. 
And about two weeks later, I got an email from the head of technology and said, we've implemented your feature. There's now uh, 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 an ability to change the font size within our app. So you know, companies will listen. I don't think all of them will listen, but it's, it's worthwhile just reaching out to them and say, you know, if you did this, it would fix an accessibility bug. Can I just jump in and echo that there, Kyron? Um, and mm -hmm. it's just really to, to reinforce it, your point earlier on. Um, that in connection with this directive, and as we've explained, this really applies presently to public body uh, websites and mobile platforms. And yes, certainly feel free to, to tell NCBI and to contact the NDA, but also to contact the, the public body directly themselves and their um, web team, because exactly as you've highlighted there, they might not know about it until they're informed. Um, so it, it, it might not be it just might simply be an issue that they've overlooked um, and I, I think that it's the best to, to contact them directly as well. Thank you, June. Totally agree. It's always it's always a first port of call to to ask people to fix things and not assume that they don't want to. They might not know. Another question. Uh, would it be too much of a challenge to approach WordPress and Joomla CMS to ask they start the ball rolling to get developers to be more accessible? or to have an accessible section in the extensions listing? Um, I, I don't believe I don't believe it's 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 something that's impossible to do, um, but I probably that would come from your team, June, I would assume, but I could be wrong. Um, it, it's certainly something that's doable. We, we haven't come across this issue at the minute, um, but I, I do think I, I, I suppose the challenge really is to um, reach out also to um, computer science gr graduates and trainees um, and to work with kind of universities as well to ensure that accessibility knowledge is built in. That That's important um, as, as well as contacting uh, developers um, within I said WordPress um, and Joomla C CMS. I'm probably saying that totally wrong. And another one, uh, great question here. Thank you, Brendan. Um, great session, Brendan says. Are there synergies possible to join forces with the RNIB to jointly advocate and lobby for greater accessibility of businesses common across UK and Ireland? Jim, would you like to answer that one from an advocacy perspective? Um, Sorry, Liz, but my wife, I just dropped there. I'm just reading oh, uh, Brendan's no message there. Are there synergies okay, possible? Certainly. I'll read it again. Great session, Brendan says. Are there synergies possible to join forces with the RNIB to jointly advocate and lobby for greater accessibility of businesses common across the UK and Ireland? Um, there's plenty of opportunities to do that. Um, something that we want to um, be more proactive on. Um, and it is definitely something that I, I think NCBI and RNIB can be, as I said, um, identify common areas that we want to, to lobby on. So yes, is the simple answer to that one. Great, thank you. And I, I second that from an advocacy perspective. Uh, Donald Rice has uh, published a, uh, some information here saying that the NDA has published an information note on the directive. So there's a there's a um, and an, uh, a website link here on the directive that we that um, that is is unpublished on this chat, so uh, we we can we can share that. Yeah. Thank you, Donald. Great, thanks, thanks, Donald, for for doing that. I was trying to find that earlier, um, so thanks for sharing that. And one more, they're coming. Another one coming in. Um, DVS, the the top V. I'm not too sure what DV is. DVS. Uh, they just don't know about it. They have no clue what is ARIA and, and how it works 99% of the time. Developers just don't test for accessibility and they can't do it efficiently because they don't use screen readers themselves. Regarding the WordPress, their own themes are absolutely accessible and it really can't be fixed simply because WordPress can be responsible for how anyone implements their code. Karen, any comments on that? Um, 
I mean, I, I can't comment on the, the competency of, of, of developers, you know. I can only comment on the people that I've worked with before. And, you know, you're right, they don't really understand accessible accessibility. But what I can tell you is, um, in my experience, and I can only comment on my experience, developers are willing and actually eager to fix accessibility issues. Um, so, you know, I think there's, you know, with the likes of this type of legislation, people will people will get to a point where, you know, they begin to understand it more and more because they're obliged to do it. I think that's nothing but a good thing. Uh, with regard to, to WordPress, I kind of agree and I disagree with you, to be honest. Um, you know, there's an, you know, there's two options. You either use a, a built-in template from WordPress because you don't really know what you're doing, and that's either accessible or it's not. You know, um, and with WordPress, obviously, you can you can make amendments. If you make amendments, you're going to potentially break things. So it's it's very hard for me to to to, to comment to comment on that. You know, um, but um, I, in general, I think what you're saying is probably true. You know. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Donald has just made a comment here about the uh, the link that he shared, and he says it provides links to the redress process under the Disability Act and the Equal Status Act as referenced by June. So he just um, clarified what it what what was meant there. Uh, any other questions, anyone? Um, any final comments then from June and Karen, please? Um, I suppose my final comment would be um, that it, thanks for everybody for, for listening. Um, certainly the EU Web Accessibility Directive is something we're, we're very passionate about to try and ensure that um, all public body websites and mobile platforms are as accessible as possible. Um, and just to extend the invitation again to people to share with us their experiences of trying to, to navigate these um, websites. And um, essentially in terms of uh, Kyron's NCBI Smart Hub, um, just to ask people to consider would they be interested in becoming a, a tester um, of these uh, features um, as they are being released and um, just to in invite people to consider volunteering to, to do that. Um, but otherwise, thanks very much for everybody for their attention. And Karen, just before you summarise there, we just have another uh, comment, another question actually from Red King. Uh, would there be grants available to smaller entities to allow them of to afford difficult accessibility challenges with their websites? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that one, but I think there is a Leo Innovation Grant that might assist in it. But again, I'm, that's not really my area of expertise. Um, uh, and I haven't heard of any grants yeah. being available um, at the minute. I, to be so fair, I, I think the more publicity that we put on this um, by ourselves and, and, and other bodies, um, then I think it'll just give greater um, credence to the, to the value of having to um, comply with the, the directive. And possibly at that point, grants could be available um, to in, encourage greater compliance. Thank you both. And Karen, did you just want to summarise there? I cut in on you with another question. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> uh, um, just to, to iterate what, what June said, if, if people want to get involved in the, in the Smart Hub project, I, I would love as many people to be involved as possible. It's um, just let us know at smarthub at ncbi.ie or I'm sure if they contract uh, the advocacy team, they'll forward on contact information. OK, everyone. Well, thank you all for attending today. Thank you to our speakers, Karen O'Mahoney and June Tinsley from NCBI. I, did, I, did, I was remiss in not giving apologies from our CEO, Chris White who was unavailable today. So thank you, June, for stepping in. And thank you, everyone, for attending. The recording will be, will be made available on NCBI's website. And we'll look forward to seeing you back again next month on the third Thursday for our next Advocacy Talks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.